All right. Well, good morning, everybody here with us today. So glad that you have chosen to make us part of your day. For those joining with us online, we're glad that you are here as well. If you can stand, we'd ask you to stand with us and let's sing together this morning.
Wow. That gets your juices flowing. Oh my goodness. I'm so, when I see that video, I'm so overwhelmed by God's goodness and faithfulness. I'm going to call my, my beloved sidekick up here. <laughs> this is Professor Spark. Well, he was Professor Spark all week. Um, and we just had the pleasure of being a part of what God did here uh, last week here at Pursuit. Um, we started off the week with 31 registered. Um, and then on the first and second day, we had an additional 11 register. Um, so we were at 42. And then uh, we had about 23 adult volunteers, 15 teenagers. So we had a total of about 80 people here Monday through Thursday, every day last week. Um, yeah, it was, it was pretty phenomenal. Um, so we ha each night we provided dinner um, for the families that came in. Um, we, yes, pizza. And we, <laughs> we also had worship every night, which what you saw on the video. We had um, amazing games and crafts and Bible adventures and stories, and it was just amazing. Uh, throughout the week, kids learned that they are God's masterpieces, and they are created in Christ Jesus with a purpose and empowered by the Holy Spirit to do God's good and his work in the world. Uh, we planted so many seeds and just did so much good. Um, just so grateful. Um, so, Professor Spark, did you have any observations of, uh, of the week that you'd like to share with the group? Yeah, so I, I, I had a couple. Um, so, first of all, as a father, it was great for me to actually see my child interacting with the kids and actually participating in worship. You know, prior to coming to Pursuit, that is something that we have been looking for for a long time. But I actually had the, the privilege of also walking around and taking the pictures and taking the videos of all the kids. And you know, I, I think what sticks out to me is that second night we had a child come up to you and say, I went home last night and Googled all the videos so that I would know how to do the songs and how to do the dances the next day. And from that point on, she was up here on stage worshiping the entire time. Yeah, it was awesome. And one thing that was new, uh, for pursuit as we had a preschool ministry we had a preschool crew we had a special needs crew um, which was just wow it was just filled me with so much joy to watch these students uh, interact and participate in all the activities throughout the week um, I just really wanted to thank everyone who participated even if you just prayed for the week thank you so so very much all of the work was an investment in the eternities of these kids. And I just, I can't wait to see what God does in their lives. Um, I especially want to thank my creative team, which is Sheree Adams and Nicole Evans. They are the most incredible humans. Um, Sheree was our crafts leader, um, and she transformed the whole space downstairs into a craft studio. And when she looked through the curriculum and saw the game, uh, the craft, she was like, "No, no, we need to. We're gonna, we're gonna change these." So she modified them for the special needs kids. She modified them for the preschool kids. It was just amazing. And then Nicole was my multimedia guru. She did the outreach all week. She did, made the signs that you see around. I mean, she just, God just provided. His fingerprints were all over the week and I'm just so eternally grateful so I'm glad you guys got to see a little glimpse of what went on and just again thank you so much and also we want to make sure that we give Melissa a huge round of applause for putting this on and and making this happen and also isn't it amazing that with like we didn't even have to go out and find somebody weird looking to be Professor Spark because <laughs> We just had it right here with the hair naturally. So anyway, incredible week of reaching out to our community. Yeah. Yeah, so the kids are going to head down to Pursuit Kids now, but we just wanted to have that uh, conversation and uh, let you guys know how incredible of a week it was here at Pursuit Church. Before we jump back into worship, get into our message today, I want to remind you guys about two, three things here. Number one, there's a connection card in the seat back in front of you. We'd love for you to take a few seconds, fill that thing out, and uh, let us know who you are and how we can stay connected with you. And uh, if you'd like any information about anything on the back side of that card, take a few seconds, fill it out, check the box. Also, if you're here in the room with us, we would encourage you to support Pursuit Church with your tithes and your offerings. Uh, we don't pass a basket around here at Pursuit Church, but in the back of the room, there is a bucket. Or if you're joining with us online or here in the room, you can always go to PursuitChurch.life, click on the Give button, and make your safe, easy donation 
that way, but I would encourage you to support Pursuit Church with your tithes and your offerings. And lastly, coming up here in just two weeks on July 31st, we are going to first our, host our first of many this year uh, praise, prayer, and worship nights, prayer and worship nights. And we would encourage you, we said from the outstart of this church just a few months ago that we wanted to make prayer a priority. And so we would encourage you to be here July 31st for an evening of prayer and worship, 6 p.m., and uh, just come with your heart ready to, to pray, to seek God, and I believe it's going to be an awesome, awesome night. All right, with that said, we're going to pray, then we're going to jump back into worship. Father, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Help us to not take these moments for granted, but recognize that we are in the presence of God. We are in the presence of of your greatness, your holiness. And God, I pray that you would speak to us today. God, that you would draw us near. And God, that we would lay down whatever might be on our, that, that's weighing us down, whatever heavy thing that may be. And that God, you would help us to be able to hear you and see you clearly. God, we pray that as we open up your word here in just a few moments, that you would speak to us. God, that we would hear it, that we would receive it, but it wouldn't just be something that we hear. It would be something that we respond to with our whole heart and our whole life. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Stand with us if you can. We're going to continue to sing and worship today. Christ is my reward. together make it your prayer this morning saying I have decided to follow Jesus
We're going to sing one last song together this morning. It's kind of a, a new song, but also a, a really old song based on the song, When We All Get to Heaven. And so when you get these words, I want you to sing them loud with us this morning.
Thank you guys so much for singing with us. You can go ahead and take a seat. Well, good morning, everybody, again. And uh, first of all, I just want to say a huge thank you for coming to uh, first service throughout the summer months here. I know we just started this, and it seems kind of small to start, but I, I have a vision. In one year's time, I know this seems crazy, but in one year's time, this one's going to be bigger than the second service. Yeah, yeah. So you guys keep it up. We're doing great here. So glad that you're with us. We are in week six of our summer series called When in Rome, where we are studying through the book of Romans, where a guy by the name of Paul wrote a letter. We intercepted it and put it in our Bible. And in this letter, he has this incredibly difficult task of trying to unite all these people coming together in the city of Rome under the name of Jesus. And you've got Jews coming, you've got Gentiles coming, and they're all believing in Jesus, but they're kind of believing in Jesus in different ways, and they're certainly practicing in different ways. And so Paul says, I've got to unite them all under the umbrella of Jesus together, which is an incredibly difficult task. And so far, we've gone through six chapters. We are on chapter seven today, the most difficult of all. So if this is your first time here, you picked a great one. And, uh, this one is the one that I think that most of us can relate to maybe more than any other chapter in the Bible. It's the one where Paul talks about struggle. Have you ever wondered maybe in your life why you can't figure certain things out, why you can't move past certain things? Maybe if you're, especially if you've been in church for a long time, if you've been around this for a long time, you're thinking, man, I should be a little bit further along than I am when it comes to my spiritual journey here. Like, I feel like I struggle with the same things I've always struggled with. Anybody ever have that feeling in life? Yeah, a few, I didn't even ask you to raise your hands, and some of you are doing this, some of you are pointing at your spouse, let's not do that, but you get the idea that some of us really struggle with this. Have you ever read a book by the, uh, a guy named Robert Louis Stevenson called Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde? Anybody ever read it? You know, okay, so the definition of a classic book is that everybody's heard of it and nobody's read it. And I think that's kind of what, how many of you have ever seen a movie based on Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde? Okay, now we're, okay, how about, you ever seen the Bugs Bunny cartoon based on it? Now, there we go, we're getting everybody in the room now. Okay, so in this book, Robert Louis Stevenson, by the way, was a believer in Jesus, and Romans chapter 7 is where he got the inspiration for this book. He said that he was kind of this upstanding citizen, and, uh, but he felt like there were two sides of him, the good side and the bad side, which was hindering the good side from fully coming out. And he said that he felt like an incongruous compound of good and evil. You ever feel like that? And so he, being a chemist, decided that he was going to make a potion that would separate these two beings within him. The good, Dr. Jekyll, came out during the day, and the bad, Mr. Hyde, derived from the word hideous or hidden, came out at night, and it turned out to be a bit of a disaster. But maybe you can relate to the sentiment that you feel like there is this good part of you, and then there's this evil part of you, and you don't know what to do with it. If you can relate to that, today is the day for you. And Paul is going to speak directly directly to this issue, and he's going to show us what to do about the lifelong struggle that you may have been experiencing with sin in your life. And so if you've ever had any interest in that, which I think all of us probably have, today is for you. And so if you have your Bible, go ahead and flip over to Romans chapter 7. We'll get there in just a second, but Paul is really going to be teaching us Two big thoughts, two, two big ideas for today. The first one is, he, he's kind of taught us this for the whole first six chapters of Roman, and that is that sin doesn't control where you go when you die. Paul has been explaining that, shouting it from the rooftops of Rome. He's been saying, sin doesn't control where you die. In other words, sin does not have the final say in your eternal destination. Jesus has the final say if you put your trust in him, which is this monumental, huge idea that they needed to know. But the next idea is going to floor you. You guys ready for it? I'm not sure you're ready for it, but we're going to say it. Hold on. Here's the thing. Before we put it up there, 
I need you guys to really open up your heart to what Scripture is going to say. Because some of you have already thought about this idea, this concept. Some of you may have been told by a pastor or a denomination something that you believe about this idea. Some of you maybe just from your past experience have already come to an understanding of what you think is true. But what I need you to do, and this will be easier for some than others, I just need to wipe your mind clean for a second. And I need you to approach Scripture today from a fresh perspective, brand new idea. What is Paul really going to teach us about sin today? Because here's his big idea, and this is what I want you to walk away with. Sin doesn't have to control how you live right now either. Sin doesn't control your eternal destination, but also sin doesn't have to control how you live in this world world. Paul may put it like this. He may say that you are a brand, not yet, he may say that you are a brand new creation. You are something brand new. Why would you continue to live as if you were the same person that you once were? That's the big idea that Paul wants to get across to all of us today. And he's going to do it in two different ways. He's going to talk about the battle that we can't win, and then he's going to talk about the battle that we can't lose. So let's start by talking about the battle that we can't win. That sounds encouraging, right? You ever had a battle in your life that you couldn't win? Maybe with uh, a boss, a neighbor, your spouse, I don't know. A battle that you could not win. Uh, let me just give you an example of this. When I was 18 years old, uh, I was driving to school one day in North Georgia, and it was just kind of this back roads, two-lane road, but there was an accident up ahead of me, and I could see the accident. I could see that everybody was okay, and I could see that people were walking around, and there were a couple police cars there, but I had to wait because the road was completely blocked, but if I kept waiting, guess what I was going to be late for? School. I was going to be late. It was like my first week of college, and I was like, I can't be late on the first week of college, and so I decided maybe I need to pull around, turn around, go the other way, and uh, get to school a different way. And so I start thinking about it, and I start to edge a little bit, and I'm still in my lane. And the next thing I know, a police car coming from the opposite direction in the opposite lane with no sirens and no uh, lights flashing rips into my bumper, hits me right at the front of the car, just kind of knocks it loose, breaks a headlight, and then just kind of keeps on going. And I'm like, do I leave? What do I do here? And finally, another officer, a different officer, comes up to me and says, wait right here for a few minutes. Uh, we're getting his statement. Then we'll, we'll figure out what we're going to do about all this. I said, okay, I can wait a few minutes. I'm already late. Why not? He comes back over 10 minutes later with a piece of paper in his hand. He says, we're giving you a citation for failure to yield to an emergency vehicle. What? So I began to fight with, not like physically fight with this officer, that would have been bad, but I began to argue a little bit, like, wait, wait a second, I was in my lane, I wasn't really even moving, he hit me, he was coming in the wrong direction, this is not cool. The officer said, well, the other guy's already left, so it's his word against yours, here's your ticket. I called, I called the number on the ticket, and I started talking to anybody that would listen to me. I said, listen, I was not doing any, I was just in my lane, he was coming in the wrong direction, no lights, no. and they said, I'm sorry, we can, the best we can do is give you a court date. I said, yes, I want a court date, and I had visions of like Tom Cruise walking into the <laughs> courtroom, 4th of July kind of moment, and I was like, I'm going to win this thing, and I was like, I'm going to face down my accuser, it's going to be great, and I get there, and he's not even there, it's just a judge. And he said, well, I, I see this, but any time that there is an issue where an emergency vehicle gets hit at the scene of an accident, somebody always gets a ticket. So you're just going to have to pay the $92. I'm still considering appealing to the Supreme Court on this one because I think I deserve this. But have you ever felt like there was just some battle that you couldn't win in your life like that? No matter how hard you tried, eventually you just had to let go. Well, that's kind of the way Paul's going to start the conversation in Romans chapter 7. He's going to start talking about this battle that we just can't ever seem to win. So if you have your Bible, flip over to chapter 7. We're going to read a few verses at a time, get to the heart of what Paul is trying to say, and then some really good news at the end. Verse 7, what shall we say then? Is the law sinful? Paul talks a lot about the law in Romans because he's talking to a, a, lot of Jewish, a lot of a Jewish audience here. He's talking about the law of Moses, and he's asking, is the law sinful? Certainly not. Nevertheless, I would not have known what the law, what sin was had it not been for the law. 
For I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said you shall not covet. So what's Paul talking about here with the law and sin and coveting and all this stuff? What Paul is saying is when he looked at himself, he thought he was doing pretty good. And then when he looked at the law of Moses from the Old Testament, he said, wow, I'm not doing so good at all. The law was kind of like this mirror that revealed how bad we really were, how far off of God's standard of holiness and goodness we really were. It would be like if you had a mirror at your house that if you stood in a certain place, had the outline of your perfect build and figure, and you just looked at how far off you were. You would eventually stop doing that, right? But you're like, man, love handles need to come to the biceps. Let's, let's do some things. That's kind of like what the law did. The law made you see how imperfect you really were, how far off you were. And it said, you know what? You're never going to be able to get there. And that's kind of the way that Paul started feeling. Like the law revealed to me that I could never measure up. And then he starts talking about this one specific commandment in the law, the 10th commandment. Who knows what, we're a small group here. Who knows what the 10th commandment is? Great, you shall not covet. You shouldn't covet. You guys know what it means to covet, right? To want something that doesn't belong to you and not be satisfied till you get it. So Paul starts going off on this idea of coveting. And this is what he says in the next few verses. He says, but sin, versus verse 8, but sin seizing, oh, I think we lost something here. There we go. But sin seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, and that commandment is the 10th one, afforded by the commandment, produced in me every kind of coveting for apart from the law sin was dead once i was alive apart from the law but when the commandment came sin sprang to life and i died i found that the very commandment that was intended to bring life actually brought death for sin seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment the tenth one deceived me and through the commandment put me to death so then the law is holy and the commandment is holy righteous and good did that which is good then become death to me by no means, nevertheless, in order that sin might be recognized as sin, it used what is good to bring about my death, so that the commandment, sin, so that the com through the commandment, sin might become utterly sinful. That was a confusing way of Paul saying, "I thought I was doing pretty good until I got to the tenth commandment, because like all the other commandments are like external things, right? It's like don't commit murder. Okay, I won't do that. Don't you know lie? Don't steal. All these things are external. Don't take the Lord's name in vain. And then it comes, don't covet. Wait a second, that's on the inside. That's very different than all the other commandments. As a matter of fact, scholars tell us that that is the commandment that is behind all the other commandments. Why? Do, like why? Do, why would you want to steal? Because you covet something that's not yours. Why would you commit adultery? Because you covet something that's not yours. It's behind all the rest of them. Paul got to that and he was like, wow. It was like he looked in that mirror and said, I don't measure up. And as a matter of fact, I can never measure up. I'm never going to have what it takes to overcome this. And so he starts talking about this struggle, this struggle that he's going to have for the rest of his life. You guys want to hear it? Here's how he talks about this struggle in verse 14. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is the sin living in me. So Paul now says, not only is this like a big problem, but like, I, I don't even think there's anything I can do about it. Like I, he said, I am sold as a slave to sin. I don't even have a say in the matter. I just got to do what the sin inside of me is telling me to do. This is the struggle that he feels. And then he goes on, for I know, this is verse 18, for I know that good itself does not dwell in me. That is in my sinful nature, for I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is the sin living in me that does it. <laughs> this is Paul's, this is like his masterpiece because it's like he's saying, I really want to get this right. Like, I don't want to live in sin my whole life. I I, I want to figure this out. I, I want to be the person. And he said that when he started trying to figure out it, it made it even worse. And then he gets into a little bit more of this. He says, so I find this law at work. 
Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law at sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am. And then he asked the most amazing question. Maybe one of the most amazing questions in all the Bible. Who will rescue me from this? Like he just laid out everything that was wrong. The struggle that exists, the struggle that you have felt in your life. And then he gets to the very end, he's like, and there's nothing I can do about it. And then he says, and who's going to rescue me from it all? And the great amazing thing is that he has an incredible answer. An incredible answer to who's going to rescue him from it all. And I'm going to tell you guys the answer, but I'm going to tell you the answer. But listen to me. It's going to require something of you. If you want to get to the bottom of this, if you want to be able to live in a way where sin is no longer your master, where you don't have to live where sin controls everything that you do, like Paul was just talking about. Paul says there's a way, but it's going to require something of you. You guys ready to hear it? I, I, Paul's going to put this in, in, in some really unique terms. I, I put it into three words that all start with the same letter, so hopefully you'll remember it. And the three words, first one is declare. Everybody say declare. I have to declare in my heart, in my soul, what Jesus really did. Here's Paul's answer. He said, thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. So there's his answer. The answer is that he is delivered through Jesus. What you have to learn to declare or, or fully believe, and I believe that so many of us really struggle to believe this, but I have to believe that did, Jesus did not just break the power of death. He did not just save me from hell, but Jesus broke the power of sin too. And I think that's a place that many of us don't think actually could be true in our lives. And it's kind of insulting to Jesus who went to the cross to say, oh, we believe that you could break the power of this and I can go to heaven, but to break the power of sin, oh, Jesus, you don't know how bad I am. Yes, he does know how bad you am. And he died for you anyway to break the power of sin in your life. It's like sin had a claim on you. I was watching this TV show the other day. I was in a hotel, and when I get to a hotel and the Braves game doesn't work, I have to watch weird things. And I was watching this, uh, this crime show, and uh, there was this family that had owned a farm out west for like 150 years of their life. It had been in the family, but they had fallen on hard times, and they decided they needed to sell this. It was prime land. And so somebody comes, and they buy it up for a few million dollars, and, and they go to find what they have bought on this farm. And guess who's still living there? The family that sold it to them. And they say, we don't know what you're talking about. This is our farm. Then they go to the police in that town, and the police was like, um, we've been here our whole lives. That's their farm. And then they go to a local judge, and the local judge is like, no, I'm pretty sure that's their farm. And talk about that lawyer moment that I was telling you about earlier. A lawyer from out of state had to come with all the paperwork, with all their guns blazing, to prove that it indeed was not their farm anymore. And I feel like that's kind of what we put Jesus through when he's like, okay, listen, I know that sin had a claim in your life, in your physical body. Sin had the claim. It had lived there. But I bought you with a price. And sin doesn't have that claim in your life anymore. And we're like, I'm pretty sure it does. I'm pretty sure I just have to do whatever I want to do whenever I want. Jesus is like, no, 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 no. Let me tell you guys something. Sin does not have to be your master anymore. We're like, uh-huh. Yeah, it does because we, we can't do right. Jesus finally just comes and lays it down. He says, listen. I broke the power of sin and death in your life. Let me explain it like this. This is the way that Paul explained it. This is, this is you guys, okay? This is us. Can you guys see this word? See it in the back? What's it say? Sin. Yeah. Love the enthusiasm. And this is you, right? You got, you're all smiling, happy, red. We got the Hulk in here as well. Right here. This is all of you got. Oh, wait a second. My wife's in there too, but she is perfect in every way, so she doesn't belong in there. But the rest of you... The rest of you, you belong in here, and you're all in sin. This is the way that you were born. We talked about this two weeks ago. And what Jesus said literally happened is that you, when you put your trust in him and you believe, you declare with your heart, with your life, that Jesus has broken the power of sin, you are no longer in sin. Instead, you are in, what's this one say? Christ. You are now in Christ, and you are a new person. You no longer have to live with this as your master anymore. 
This is what Paul says is true. And if you put your trust in him, you are no longer a slave to sin. You are a child of God. I don't know that a lot of us get to that place where we believe that. But I want to tell you, it's true. Now, does this mean that you're going to be perfect for the rest of your life? No, because you've lived here so long that some of that has rubbed off on you. But let me tell you what happens when you do sin and you're here. It's like it sticks out in your heart. We call that conviction. And you know it immediately that this is not where I belong. I, I, I'm like, it would be like uh, I was at a Braves game not too long ago, and there was a, uh, a Cardinals fan in Jersey right in the middle of all the Braves fans. And he's like, he didn't belong. When you sin and you're in Christ, you're going to recognize super fast this doesn't belong, and it's going to eat at you and convict you until you change. But sin does not have to have power over you anymore, according to what Paul says. And let's define sin real quick as a willful act of disobedience. I do not have to willfully disobey God's word and will for my life anymore because I am in Christ. Second thing you have to do that starts with the letter D is this. You have to decide. Everybody say decide. decide. I have to decide. i got to make up my mind. What, what do I want to devote my life to? What, what, what do I really want to give my life to? I, I have to decide that this is what I really want to do. And I have to be intentional. You know, there's this crazy thing going on in the world right now where it feels like nobody wants to take responsibility for their actions. Right? You know, it, it's like we're being told, oh, but everything that's happened around you is the thing that's really at fault here. It's not you. It's, it's the world. It's not you. It's everything else. But I want to tell you guys, you have a responsibility in this. You get to determine what you do and don't do. It's your responsibility. And you've got to decide what you're going to offer yourself to. The way that Paul words it is, is like this. Chapter 6, verse 12, he says, Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. And then he says this, Do not offer any part of yourself to sin. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been bought, brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. You've got to decide what you're going to offer yourself to, period. What have you decided? And the third D, we're going to skip that next verse. The third one is this. We've got to devote. Everybody say devote. When we go a step further than deciding, we've got to devote ourselves to it. What does it mean to have devotion? It means to have love and loyalty and passion for the rest of your life to something. You've got to daily decide and devote yourself to this. And to say, God, I, I, maybe you even have to learn to pray a prayer like this. God, today sin is going to want to take control of my hands. But instead, I offer them, I devote them to you. God, today, my mind, my eyes, sin's going to want to claim my eyes and my mind for itself today. And there's going to be plenty of opportunity for that to happen. But today, I devote them to you. God, sin is going to want to use my words. You might have to pray this one three or four times because our words can really get us in trouble. Sin is going to want to use my mouth and my words today, but I devote them to you. I offer them to you for the rest of my life. If you declare with your whole heart, and you believe with your whole heart that Jesus can break the power of sin, not that you would be perfect, but that you would be his. If you decide that this is the, what you want to do with your life, I want to pursue Jesus and become more like him, and you devote your life to it, I promise you what you're going to find is that the power of sin is broken, and you can live a life fully committed and devoted to Jesus. Now, let me give you four things that will completely destroy this in your life. All right, good news we're going to end on. Number one is if you disconnect yourself from prayer. Number two, if you disconnect yourself from God's word and obedience to his word. Number three, if you disconnect yourself from the presence of the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. And number four, if you disconnect yourself from the church. You can just say all these things that you have devoted yourself to, it's kind of going to be ineffective, right? If the church is just something that you do whenever it's convenient, whenever something else isn't going on, if, if the presence of the Holy Spirit isn't a priority in your life, if prayer and scripture are not a priority in your life, 
But if you truly want to devote yourself to Jesus, I promise you, I promise you, you can experience freedom and you don't have to let sin determine how you live. Does that mean temptation is going to go away forever? No. Even Jesus was tempted. Does it mean you're going to be perfect forever? No. But it means that when you recognize that you are in Christ, sin has no place in your life. And we call that conviction and you move on from it. Stand with me if you would. I want to pray for you. And maybe today you need to make a decision. Maybe today you need to declare and decide and devote your life to this. So everybody just bow your heads and close your eyes with me for just a moment. And I want to give you the opportunity to respond to God's word today. Because I don't want you to have to live in sin any longer. I don't want it to have to be your master. And so if you're here today and you would say, you know what, what Paul talked about at the very beginning of that chapter, that's what I feel. Like I feel the struggle all the time and there's nothing I can do about it. If that's you, I think Jesus wants to show you that he broke the power of sin in your life. Not so that you'd be perfect, so that you could devote yourself to him fully. And so if you have never experienced that kind of Holy Spirit power in your life, Today is the day that can change everything. And so I, I'm going to just take 30 seconds or so right now and let the Holy Spirit speak into your life. Take 30 seconds and just let God speak to you. And if you need to respond, you can come to the front and pray. You can pray right where you are. You can come and talk to me afterwards and we can, we can get deep into it. But I don't want you walking out of here today without the opportunity to respond to what God taught you through his word today. So take 30 seconds and let the Holy Spirit speak to you. Father, today we respond to your word. God, for some of us, we needed to be convicted of sin in our hearts. And we needed to be reminded, or maybe even told for the first time, that this has no power over us. That you broke the power of sin by your death and resurrection. God, you needed to show us that we have access to a power to overcome according to your word to overcome and not be in sin anymore, but instead we are in Christ. And some of us need to declare that in our lives, maybe for the very first time to experience that Holy Spirit power. God, some of us need to decide. We gotta decide what we're living for. Do I live for myself? Do I live for sin? Do I live for this world? Or do I live for you? Decided to offer myself completely to you. Father, some of us need to decide that we're going to devote our lives to this, that it's not just a one-time decision, but it's an everyday decision for the rest of my life to follow. God, wherever the decision lies with us today, let it be real. Let it bring transformation. Help us know that we are brand new and we don't have to be the same person that we used to be because of what you have done for us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have a great Sunday, everybody. We'll see you guys back next week for part 7, 915 or 1045. We'll see you guys then.